little boy ever dreamt of being a railway porter when he grew up? After all, where's the glamour and excitement in carrying things around for other people? But freight trains did carry Britain's things around for a hundred years or more, and the engines that pulled and pushed and shunted up and down, to and fro, were the real strength of the railway system, the ones that got things done. You don't actually need engines at all for a railway, of course. Horses will do just as well, if you only need to pull one full truck or a few empties a short way. And in fact, they used horses with rails long before engines were ever thought of, and were still using them for shunting in the 1940s. The 16-ton truck became standard on railways because it was what a horse could pull. But for trains with two or more trucks going a long way, there's only one kind of horse that can do it, the iron horse. I'm afraid there isn't much nostalgia for steam goods trains, and people didn't even notice them much at the time. They just trundled slowly past, holding up the express that you wanted to get on. And yet, from 1850 onwards, freight trains always made more money than passenger trains. Railway freight gave us a whole way of life, the pick-up goods era. Railways were the common carrier, which meant that they were legally obliged to carry any consignment, however small, to any destination, however remote. Everything from sheep to strawberries, anywhere in Britain. Now, the whole trouble with a pick-up goods train is that it's great for the community, but it's a big headache for the railway. What a railway really likes is a long goods train full of just one thing, I mean, coal or oil or cars, which goes straight from its starting point to its destination without stopping to pick up the farmer's chickens. And this was the way freight was going more and more into vast bulk. But the vaster and bulkier the trains got, the harder they were to pull. Uh, the quick, cheap and easy solution was to get two engines on the front. But this was a false economy because although two trains are twice as expensive, they are not twice as efficient. And also apparently there was a temptation for many drivers to assume that the other engine was doing most of the work. And if they both thought that, well, there were problems. No, the most sensible, if expensive solution was to build much bigger and much stronger engines. And this engine behind me, a Class 9, is the biggest and strongest that British Rail ever built for freight. This particular one, which has been preserved by the East Somerset Railway, actually holds the record for pulling the heaviest load ever known on a British line. And one of the nice things about working on a film like this is that very occasionally, very occasionally, you do get to drive in the cab yourself, so... Today we're pulling, rather ironically, a load of stone. The stone used to build roads and help the railway's great rival, the motor vehicle. British Rail's other great contribution to the steam era, of course, was to kill its stone dead. And these 9Fs were scrapped in the 1960s with almost indecent haste. This was one of only five to be preserved. I can see why people thought this was British Rail's finest contribution to the steam age. The feeling of power and strength is immense. thinking that it had taken the railways a hundred years to find out that the type of loads they moved best were the ones they started with. The no-nonsense train with just one kind of cargo on board. 
slate was first carried in bulk by boat and canal. But you can't get boats up the quarries of North Wales. What you can use is a narrow gauge railway and a little tank engine. Now, if our engines had evolved entirely on mountainsides among sharp, narrow curves, they might all look like this 040 tank engine built in 1889, especially for the job. But, of course, they didn't. Just coming up to its 100th birthday, this 060 tender engine was designed to haul heavy, frequent loads over the industrial centre of England. Before the 060 could go out earning money for the Lancashire and Yorkshire railway shareholders, it had to be fed and watered. So much coal was dug out of our minds that in 1900 the French put round a malicious rumour that Britain was about to become buoyant and float away. But it's hard for us to imagine what quantities of coal were eaten up in the steam age, which should perhaps be called the coal age. Coal fed British industry from ironworks to Royal Navy destroyers, from engines in Penzance to shipyards in Glasgow. The freight of many railway lines was over 50% coal. A lot of that coal never left the railways at all. It simply went down the line to feed hungry engines. Railway engines are the only vehicles I can think of which go just as fast backwards as forwards. But going backwards is not much fun for the driver and fireman. So it's onto the turntable. Turntables were originally operated by hand, but then they realized that the steam vacuum created in the engine could be used to do the job just as well. So they plug it in and make it suck itself round through its navel. For a hundred years, the standard British workhorse looked almost exactly like this. Three pairs of driving wheels to spread the axle load, and none of the wheels very big, not good for speed, but good for traction, and a large tender for all that coal and water they got through. Meanwhile, there's a job of putting the train together. It's beneath the dignity of the big engine to do work like this. Mile for mile, the Lancashire and Yorkshire Railway once earned more money from freight than any other line in Britain.
I wonder if they ever worked out what proportion of freight running time was spent going up and down goods yards. I bet they were too scared to find out how long they took getting nowhere. Forty years later, and we're on, yes, the same old standard British workhorse. This one was built for the London Midland Scottish Railway. It's still an 060, the boiler's bigger, but technically the engine isn't much different. A steam buff might say it didn't need to be much different, but really it was a case of technological inertia. The rest of the world was building much bigger engines, and even experimenting with diesels. But we British steamed on blithely as before. Our mixed goods trains never moved at much more than a leisurely 20 or 30 miles an hour, for safety reasons. They didn't have enough stopping power to go any faster, because only the engine and the guard's van were equipped with brakes. What the railways wanted was for all the trucks to have brakes as well linked to the engine. Technically, they could have done it, but half the trucks on the average train belonged to private owners, everyone from coal companies to Coleman's Mustard, and they simply didn't want to invest the money in conversion. When you see a steam train rolling through a green chunk of England, it looks like a poem by John Betjeman. But it wasn't always so poetic for the crew. Tunnels were their worst enemy. Imagine the smoke and sparks being blown down into the cab for ten minutes at a go. One thing that amazes me about freight trains in Britain is that we've never built up the folklore about them that they had in America, for instance. No Casey Jones, no Rock Island Line, no Chattanooga Choo Choo or Honky Tonk Train Blues. The only hobos we ever had on British trains were tramps looking for a good night's sleep in a freight truck and getting moved overnight to somewhere they had no desire to get to. Yet there is something evocative about the old freight train. Where have all those trucks come from? What strange cargoes do they all carry? And who was waiting for it all at the other end, for the impossible job of sorting it all out? The freight handlers at Bristol Temple Meads depot, perhaps. Temple Meads is like some gigantic sideboard. A sideboard almost as big as Wembley, with 5,000 feet of platform served by 15 railroads, 35 auto trucks and four mobile cranes. Accommodation for 400 wagons and a thousand tons of goods all at one time. Goods assembled from the fields, fresh packed from the assembly line, green gathered from the factory. Here, they're sorted and served out to the city, the surrounding country, and on to the sideboards of smaller depots. Wrestling with a loose coupled train as it wended its way between England's sideboards was the province of the guard. I met Roger Hobson. Now I think it's about the least, one of the least glamorous jobs on the railway actually. Uh, to be fair, it's very little heard of compared with the driver environment. But people always get the impression you just sit here, like, oh no, not doing much. What do you actually do? Well, it's a matter of controlling the train. You see, the, the guard's in charge of the train, and on a loose coupled uh, freight train, the guard controls the train by means of using the handbrake. Uh, all the time. Simply, all the time, yes. Uh, the idea is to keep the couplings taut on the train by use of the handbrake. And what would happen if you, if you didn't? Well, the, the train could break in half, because if you get a snatch from the engine and the uh, couplings aren't tight, the train will literally break in half, which is obviously dangerous. Has that ever happened? 
Oh yes, certainly, many times. Uh, it hasn't actually happened on this railway, but in the old days, um, on the original railways, it happened fairly frequently. The Seven Valley Railway operates passenger trains as a tourist attraction, but they also occasionally move pick-up goods trains. Now, the passenger trains go faster than you do, so you have to waste time stopping and getting out of their way. And even after you've politely got into a siding and let them through, you sometimes find they've created further problems for you. I should let that bit go there, kid, nice. I should look at my you better step forward to yourself, mate. Oh, that's nice. When railways were first invented, landowners worried that trains would frighten livestock, run over animals, and set fire to the countryside. And they were dead right. For the driver and crew, it's just another headache. But for the signalman, it's a question of what kept you so long? I remember as a young boy, my father once persuading an engine driver he knew to take me out for the day. We went five miles, shunted a few trucks around and came back again. It took all day. It still does. Pickup goods train would amble through Highley once or twice a day. It dropped off trucks full of things ordered locally and picked up any truck full of things going elsewhere. Farm produce, bits of machinery, milk, racing pigeons to be released by a station master, anything. GPV, by the way, stands for gunpowder van, and for obvious reasons, this never went next to the engine. People always have a vague look of worry on the railways. The signalman worries about the next passenger train coming through. The cows worry that this screeching monster has come to take them on the last trip to the abattoir. One way of speeding up the snail's pace of goods trains around Britain was fly shunting. You put in your shunting pole while the train was still moving, uncoupled the desired van, and then ran after it to slam on the handbrake before you had a pile-up. No wonder that 50 shunters a year were killed at the turn of the century, and hundreds maimed. Unfortunately for us, time has run out. All goods traffic will have to clear off the main line because an express passenger train is arriving on it any minute. Today, the main cargo of the line is people. But in British Rail days, the main cargo was something you couldn't escape from. Even here. Mr. Richardson, you were station master here in the 1950s for five years. But um, although today this is the Seven Valley Line, it's full of birds and trees, 
In those days, it was mostly coal, wasn't it? Yes, we carried a, terif- a terrific amount of coal uh, up and down the line from Alfred Colliery. About a thousand tons a day used to come out through the watery there. So you actually dealt with more coal than passengers? Well, revenue-wise, yes. We used to deal with quite a lot of passengers, but they were all, or most of them, were short journeys. You know, workmen going to Kidderminster, the carpet factories, to the military base at Hartlebury, one or two to Bridge North, and one or two to Worcester. Starport used to take a few. In its heyday, the railway system employed an incredible three quarters of a million people, and even a small station like this had a full complement of staff. Station master and signalman, booking clerks and freight clerks, porters, shunters, and agent, not to mention the train crews themselves. Today, they have to double up on jobs. The shunter has to act as farmhand, if necessary. I can't imagine anything much nicer than living at a flowery station like this, so I'm fiercely jealous of Mrs. Oliver, who now occupies the station master's house. It's hard for us now to believe the range of services that she knew. Will you give these to Fred Jones at Harley Station, please? Of course I will, sir. Right. Thank you very Thank much you. indeed. Every little detail taken care of. railways offered a comprehensive service. The GWR would collect from your own farm, the LMS hired out grain sacks to farming customers, though they discontinued this when so few of the sacks came back, and the LNER offered a complete house moving operation. If desired, they said, arrangements can be made for the laying of carpets and linoleum, hanging of pictures, placing of articles in cupboards and shelves, etc., to complete a really trouble-free removal. It, it must have been a wonderful service to the locality, but oh, was it wasn't economic. Well, it was in its day, because of course you must remember that uh, these trains were in their heyday before there were motor vehicles. Um, so they were virtually the lifeline for the countryside communities. And nowadays, if you want to do anything like that, you go to, well, you have to by post, or you... Well, nowadays, of course, a lot of stuff doesn't go by rail. Rail is only interested in bulk loads these days. Well, um, oil, coal... Freight liner trains, yes, oil, coal, certainly to power stations, but no smalls at all now. That's the thing I keep forgetting, actually, that motor traffic is a very recent thing, really, isn't it? Oh, yes, comparatively. I mean, motor transport has really up, only come into its own since the war. Before then you went to the station. At every station they used to have a, what they call, I forget what they call him now, but he was a sort of manager who touted for business around the country areas. Really? Oh yes, absolutely. I grew up next door to the Great Western Railway and I can still remember the clanking of goods trains through the night, the lonely whistle echoing of empty wagons. It never occurred to me till now that night time was the right time for goods trains. With nothing else around, no passengers, they could get down to business. By night they flourished unseen, and unseen the mixed goods train died and vanished from British life.
Although I didn't know it at the time, shunting engines were a doomed species. When other competition arose, they would survive only in steam zoos and railway safari parks. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. If the goods train can't take you, the lorry must. 